I'm John Kovach. I've been a newsman, a sports announcer, and a football coach, but the one constant since I was old enough to stand next to a stream with my dad has been fishing. I've waded rapids, stood on slick rocks, hacked through ice, and been tossed about the deck of a boat. And I want you to love fishing as much as I do and join me on this journey. Welcome to Yankee Fisherman, presented by The Dock Shop. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Yankee Fisherman. It's Thursday, November 16th. Can't really believe we're this deep into fall. Very interesting show today because we're going to talk about one of the pioneers of fly fishing and a documentary that is about to come out about him. I'm going to let somebody else set the stage a little better than I can, though. And with that, we're going to welcome Joe Brooks, who has been one of the forces behind this documentary about his great uncle and his namesake to the show. Joe, thank you so much for calling us. It just sounds like a fascinating story about a fascinating person. It is. Uh, John, uh, thank you for having me uh, on your uh wonderful show. Uh, the, yeah, the story uh, is pretty amazing. Uh, Mike and I weren't quite uh, aware of the impact I guess uh, Joe had on the fly fishing industry until we really started uh, I guess digging in. And what drove you guys to dig in? I mean, obviously you're an angler from the, from the photos that we have of you. Is that because of your uh, great uncle, and is that what piqued your curiosity about him? Was it was it the family relation, or was it his status as a fly angler? Well, so so we grew up with <clears throat> with the stories that we hear from my dad around the dinner table about uh, about Uncle Joe, and I don't know about five. Years ago, a buddy of mine out in L.A. was starting a documentary production company. And so I just, I just penned this email to him about this crazy uncle that I had um, that was, you know, loosely, you know, a big name in the fly fishing world. And I just sort of gave him this rough outline because of his, his life was so tumultuous till he met Mary, and then everything sort of changed, which most people don't know. So I just thought, wow, this is a fantastic story. Is it just because I know a little bit about the individual, or, or is it just a fantastic story? And so that was really the genesis uh, of it. And Mike, my oldest brother, is a keen fisherman, and he and I always dreamed of traveling and fishing the places that Uncle Joe fished, and that was also part of uh, the initial concept and, and getting to the point, I guess, that we're at today. What did you learn about your uncle in researching this documentary? What did, what did we learn? What did you learn? What, were there things that you learned that you didn't know going in? I had no idea of the impact that he had on the industry in Argentina, the fly fishing industry on Argentina. For example, one of the one of the I guess leaders or fathers of Argentine fly fishing, uh, Jorge Donovan wrote a book. I can't remember the title of the book, but in one of the chapters, the chapter is called My Friend Joe Brooks. 
and he talks about Joe Brooks being a, a pro, like he came to them like a prophet, you know, this guy that brought these new techniques to them, which basically uh, flourished in Argentina. Now everybody can double haul, and everybody's you know using streamers, and they use nail knots to join uh, backing to uh, to the fly line, and and leader to the fly line, and so on, and and so many techniques and ways of fishing and things they'd never thought about and how to fish um, was pretty pretty amazing to know that he had such a huge influence there. I guess the impact in the whole saltwater fly fishing industry. You know, you can source back to a few guys, and one of those would be would be Joe Brooks. Um, so these are some things that that we sort of learned uh, along the way. Um, yeah, the saltwater part I think is big around here as we're right on the Long Island Sound, and I mean, is it fair to say that really before your uncle? Nobody had really thought about taking fly fishing techniques off the coast. Well, that's not that's not necessarily true. There were some people that were dabbling, but they were using uh, salmon flies or large wet flies. You know, you'd use in streams. But one of the earliest exponents was Tom Loving of Baltimore, who was a milliner. And he would tie flies with some of his his feathers he had for making hats. Oh, that's awesome! And he was fishing for shad in the in the upper part of the Chesapeake, and also for stripers. And I know stripers are huge up your way. And that's that's a, probably the earliest beginning of striper fishing with a fly is with Tom Loving, who who taught uh, Joe Brooks striper fishing in the Chesapeake and Upper Chesapeake uh, watershed. Very cool, and probably flies that we're still seeing today. Now, how did your uncle come, I mean, really, he became a pioneer in that you had so many celebrity fly fishers who worked with him, who sought him out. How, how did that all come about? Well, it's interesting. Um, Really, he, you know, he took over from Outdoor Life from Bergman in, I think, 68, somewhere in there. But he, he was on the American Sportsman Show, if you remember that, if your I listeners do. remember oh, I, that. I do. That's, that's going right back. But I think after, after the war, and I know Lefty talks about this, and after the war... You had all these servicemen coming back, and Joe was just in the right place at the right time. He met Mary. His life had settled down probably first for, you know, for a very long time for him. And, it, you know, he had been fishing. He was a great athlete, you know, and everything sort of just coalesced. And, he, like I said, he was the right place, right time. He was writing. He was getting a following. Uh the show came along. Joe was probably the only American at the time, really, that had been to Argentina uh, to fly fish. He was probably the smartest guy uh, in America regarding Argentine fly fishing. That's where they, they did the pilot show for the first American sportsman show, which turned out to be a, a fishing tournament. Um, and probably from that, he became well-known through through the American Sportsman Show, his writings, and I know in Bermuda they hired him to come down to work out the fishing tourism for that country. Um, but that would be what I would think is how his name got around. People wanted to fish with him. Even, you know, Fidel Castro invited him down, but... He wouldn't go, so he sent Lefty and a couple other guys to go down, which is a pretty cool story, and I know Lefty tells that story. Um, but Castro wanted Joe to come down and bring some of his mates and writers and fish there and then go back and write about it. So I, I would imagine that's how his notoriety grew and how then people, famous people, wanted to fish with him. How long have you been working to bring this documentary 
to fruition? You know, I think that's a good question. I'd have to check my, my notes. I, I reckon it's probably about, we're probably up to about five years now from the initial floating of the concept with my buddy and then getting my brother on board and then getting Lefty on board. And, yeah, it's probably about five years, I'd say. Now, we're seeing this in 2018. How is this going to be released? It will be released um, in a number of ways, of which we're still working out. <laughs> um, one, one for sure will be, um, will be, hopefully it will be in a fly fishing film tour. That's what we're, fingers crossed there. That just will be a very short snippet, but uh, it'll be released. Um, Initially, we're hoping to release it at the Brotherhood of the Jungle Cock, which is a, um, a foundation that Joe was one of the key members in starting, which is a, a fly fishing foundation set up to teach young boys and girls, I guess now, uh, about fly fishing, about the outdoors, about the stewardship of the, stewardship of the outdoors. And so we thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to go back release that on Father's Day in 2018 and oh, then that's awesome. a bigger a, a bigger release would be uh, well actually sorry their their campfire the Brotherhood of the Jungle Cock hold a campfire in May every year they've been doing that since 1948 I think or somewhere in there um, to release it then to that group and then to the to the greater audience on Father's Day in 2018 as you researched this, what was the more interesting story to you? What caught you more? His impact on fly fishing or the story behind his tumultuous earlier life and how meeting and marrying Mary settled him down? The, the impact on fly fishing is probably the easiest information because it's it's so well documented, you know, even just through his 10 books and myriad of articles in uh, Field and Stream or Outdoor Life. But his tumultuous background is fascinating because he grew up in a well-to-do family in Baltimore. He was named after his father, Joe Brooks Sr., who had a very, uh, a very successful insurance business. In, in Baltimore, and so he had everything going for him, and then he, he got caught up in, into drinking and alcoholism, and he really fought that his whole life, but in, in his early years, he, was, he wanted to play professionals baseball. He was signed with the Orioles' junior team, I guess, in those days, or whatever you'd call it, the, the seconds team, and he was... He was a pitcher. He was a quite a well, well known and and good pitcher. And but in those days, sport wasn't really an acceptable profession. So his family, pretty much, his dad in particular, pretty much said, "Nah, you can't do that." And and so his his life really went off the rails. And he was all over the place. And and in our research, um, which was pretty much conducted in the early days by myself and then for the, the documentary in a more serious manner by Tom Perrow, who's a, who's a writer, that he basically, we couldn't find a skerrick of information about him through the depression, which what we're trying, what we're finding is that's kind of normal. Some of these guys just went off the grid. You know, there's so many people out of work and, and America was in such a, a dark place, and, and that is quite, I guess, in line with where Joe was. He was in such a dark place. He even went up to, to Canada to get treatment for the alcoholism, and they run him through all kinds of crazy, I don't know, elixirs that they give him to, to cure it, and it must have been the way they did it back then. I don't know. You read this stuff, and it's like... Man, this would kill anybody. Oh um, 
and this is all fantastic stuff in the marriages that he had. We believe he had three marriages, but we can only find two, so we're not quite sure. And so there's fascinating things that will come out in the documentary um, about Joe's tumultuous background that most probably wouldn't know, which is fascinating and which also is quite inspiring because for somebody who is so screwed up, right, to climb such a high, high mountain and to be seen by so many people. What jumped such a out, great light is amazing. It, it, what jumped out at me on the website, which is joebrooksdocumentary.com, and this is, uh, I'll read this in it. The water spoke to him, and the days he spent along the coasts and riverbanks, casting a fly to lure a bass or trout, gave him solace from the nightmare he was living. Mm -hmm. And I think so many people <laughs> are looking for some degree of, of that, maybe not to that extent, but just some place where they find themselves and that place happens to be with a fly rod in hand. Is that something you hope viewers take from this documentary? Oh yeah, the for sure the, the outdoors, you know, we've all been out there fishing and you're on the coast maybe casting lures or flies to defeating uh, stripers, and you're there by yourself, or you're up a stream in the mountains, and you're, you, know, you're, you hear the wind through the leaves and, the, and the, the water over the tumbling rocks and the noise that that makes, and the sun is shining, the sky is blue, and all your worries just go away. And you can kill eight hours in a matter of seconds, can't you? <laughs> no question. No question. So that would have been what you say, the solace for him, the escape of the nightmare that he was living that he couldn't seem to get himself out of because he was addicted to, to the drink. Uh, just a fascinating story, and I'm really looking forward to when the full documentary is out. I would love to have you back on when the documentary comes back out so we can talk a little bit more about this. I'd love to come back and talk about it. Awesome. We will set that up. Joe Brooks, uh, the Joe Brooks Foundation, the Joe Brooks documentary that will be coming out in 2018. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back with more Yankee Fishermen presented by The Doc Shop right after this. The leaves are changing, water temps dropping, and the sun is setting a little earlier each day. But there's still a lot of great boating, fishing, and coast time left before we see the first snow. And above all, remember, it's always summer at the Dock Shop. With loads of new fishing tackle and accessories, clothing, jewelry, and home decor, the Dock Shop is just what you need when you start to feel that New England autumn chill. Boater, beach bum, fishermen, or simply love the New England coast, this is a unique place to shop. The Dock Shop, 51 Tokenique Road, Darien, 609 Riverside Avenue, Westport, DockShop.com. We know it's your busy season, and that's why Walter Stewart's Market is here to make things easy by offering the best of autumn under one roof. Walter Stewart's Market is your local one-stop fall shop. There are so many seasonal flavors to savor, and Stewart's has them all. From Blue Jay Orchard's local cider donuts to Vermont Farmstead cheddar and all of your favorite varieties of local apples and pears. Walter Stewart's Market, 229 Elm Street, New Canaan, and find us at stewartsmarket.com. We Want a new experience in car buying? Skip Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram with one of the largest inventories of new two- and four-door Wranglers. We are Connecticut's Wrangler headquarters. Come visit our new Ram Truck Center. Browse our websites, skipchryslerjeep.com or skipdodge.net to find the new Jeep, Chrysler Dodge car, minivan, or Ram truck you've been looking for. Just two miles from both I-95 or the Merritt Parkway exit 44. Save thousands right now at the Black Friday sales event. Ends November 30th. At Black Horse Garage, we fulfill all your sports car needs. We specialize in manufacturer-recommended service and aftermarket high-performance parts and installation. We have one of the nation's top storage facilities and offer a high-end collision department that understands your need for detail. Visit BlackHorseGarage.com for more. Weed and Durier, New Canaan's home center and full-service lumberyard. Everything for your home and improvement projects. We also carry seasonal items, barbecue grills, housewares, newest LED light bulbs, doors, windows, and much more. Weed and Durier, 21 Grove Street, New Canaan, a division of Northeast Building Supply. 
We Dr. Stephen Molinaro and Peter Healy of Family Practice Dentistry and Laser Dental Care have served Richfield for over 22 years. Experienced staff offer gentle drillless techniques, preventative care, and cosmetic procedures in a relaxed environment. Grateful for the community's trust and support through the years, new patients and their families are welcome. Call today. Dr. Steve. Welcome back to Yankee Fisherman, presented by the Doc Shop. Thanks again to Joe Brooks. I'm really looking forward to seeing that documentary uh, because it sounds like something that's going to speak to people on a number of different levels, not only anglers, but people who are dealing with struggles. I, I really cannot wait. We can't wait to have Joe back on. Last week, we had Jeff Yates on talking about the Trout Unlimited and Orvis Embraces stream. Uh, drive and just some astonishing numbers out of that. Uh, the Mianus chapter uh, raised four thousand four hundred and thirty-five dollars through that. The Nutmeg chapter raised one thousand sixty dollars. The Candlewood Valley chapter nine hundred sixty dollars. Those are just ones in Connecticut. Uh, overall, I get fifty-six thousand six hundred and four dollars raised in that, all of that going to local streams. And we'll be following those projects uh, as they continue on. Also, success on a project, and we'll be doing a piece on this, the uh, Deerfield chapter of TU up in uh, Massachusetts. They've uh, got some spawning trout in some waters that they've worked, so I'm scheduling uh, a trip up there to meet with those guys. And also, just this morning, the announcement by U.S. Fish and Wildlife of 20 grants totaling $1.29 million. This to local governments and community groups, and this all focused on the Long Island Sound. 18 of those projects and $1.2 million are for Connecticut, and then two are for other states, but it's some very cool stuff there. We're going to be doing a piece on those national uh, grants as well from Fish and Wildlife. Um, and the Mill River Wetlands Committee, who we've had on the show, they are participating in Giving Tuesday. That's a global day of giving, and that is on Tuesday, November 28th. This is another drive, similar to Embrace a, Dre a Stream, where groups come together. Mill River Wetlands Committee will use the funds raised during Given Tuesday to update its River Lab program to align with changes coming to the Connecticut science curriculum. And uh, if you go to givinggrid.com slash MRWC dash Fairfield, you can support them. And that is on Giving Tuesday, November 28th. A great project there. It, it teaches kids about the environment around the river. If you're an angler, you should care about that. You should donate to these type of things because it's the environment around the river that makes or breaks the fishing. And that's what we need to work on and all strive to make better no matter uh, where we stand politically. We're going to step out, take a quick break, come back and talk about some more upcoming events here on Yankee Fisherman presented by the Dock Shop. The leaves are changing, water temps dropping, and the sun is setting a little earlier each day. But there's still a lot of great boating, fishing, and coast time left before we see the first snow. And above all, remember, it's always summer at the Dock Shop. With loads of new fishing tackle and accessories, clothing, jewelry, and home decor, the Dock Shop is just what you need when you start to feel that New England autumn chill. Boater, beach bum, fishermen, or simply love the New England coast, this is a unique place to shop. The Dock Shop, 51 Tokenique Road, Dairy End, 609 Riverside Avenue, Westport, DockShop.com. Yeah, Dad. Kyle, I need you to update the financial statements. I took care of that yesterday, Dad. Mac, I need you to get those deals approved. They're all done, Mr. Miller. Jeff, I need you to order lunch for the meeting. They can't do a thing without me. Right now, Lisa 2017 Centra S for only $97 a month. I'm never going to retire. 
Bankwell combines the best personalized service with high-tech banking features for our customers' convenience. We pride ourselves on being a strong community partner. You don't settle for average in anything else you do. Why settle for an average bank? Don't just bank when you can bank well instead. Visit mybankwell.com for more. Manfredi New Canaan is celebrating three exceptional years selling Rolex watches and fine jewelry to the Fairfield County community. We appreciate all our loyal clients and look forward to welcoming and helping you discover the perfect gift to celebrate life's most important occasions. At Galt, we always put you first. As your full-service home heating partner, we provide expert delivery, installation, and maintenance for all your heating needs with knowledgeable, friendly professionals that give you peace of mind 24-7. Galt Family Companies, you first since 1863. At Galt. Welcome back to Yankee Fisherman, presented by the Dock Shop. A number of interesting speakers coming up around the Connecticut area in the coming days. Uh, Rich Strollis, who we've had on the show, he's going to talk about fishing Alaska on a budget and that's at the Farmington Valley TU meeting. Uh, that's tonight, Thursday the 16th, 630 to 9. That is at the Farmington Senior Center. You can get more information at fvtu.org. Mayanis TU is going to have its annual Atlantic salmon trip up to the Naugatuck River. They are going to do a trash cleanup at 8 a.m. and then fish. This is where the state stocks it. You've got 10 pounds and up salmon up there. It's a great trip, and it's one of the more beautiful places that you can find to fish in Connecticut. We did a segment last year. You can find it in our archives, like all of our shows, at han.network. Go to shows, drag down to Yankee Fisherman, and you can see just what a beautiful area that is to fish. Interesting new state record here, word from the DEEP, and that is for a clear-nosed skate, which I had not heard of, but... Uh, a, a new state record there. We've got the pictures. want to thank the DEEP for letting us uh, see those. But uh, interesting fish. Interesting to have a state record. Speaking of records, we will have a world record holder speaking to Nutmeg TU on Tuesday, the 21st at 7 p.m. Greg Meyerson of World Record Striper Company. He's going to talk about what he does about how to catch the big stripers of the Long Island Sound. That meeting, like all TU meetings, are open to the public, free of charge. Uh, so come, come by if you want to hear him. He's a great guy. We've had him on. I've seen him at a number of things. Nutmegtrout.org for details on that, plus an upcoming day after Thanksgiving striper fishing trip going to be over at the uh, Sunnyside boat ramp in Shelton. We'll have details on that up at nutmegtrout.org as well. That should be a nice day to work off the turkey dinner. Uh, Dave Perry will discuss in search of native and western native trout. In search of western native and wild trout. We'll get this right before the end of the show. That is at the Thames Valley TU meeting, and that is also on the 21st. They will also show, we talked about this in September, Bugs of the Underworld. It's a fascinating movie. They're going to show that starting at 610. And TVTU just donated $2,500 to purchase 97 acres along the Chetucket River. Very cool job. Good job by them. No show next week. It's Thanksgiving, and I will be working the Turkey Bowl coverage, New Canaan against Darien. That'll be live from Boyle Stadium. And at 2 o'clock, we'll have Nutmeg Sports. I'll be joining Frank Granito and Kevin Coleman, and we'll talk about, among other things, the upcoming Turkey Bowl. So no show next week. Enjoy your Thanksgiving. We will be back the next week with a new show. Till then, tight lines.